Hey guys, welcome to week three of our AP exam review. We're going to start with unit five, agriculture. So this unit's big ideas that we're going to cover are the agricultural revolutions, gene revolution, responses to modern agriculture, types of agriculture, the agricultural regions, the von Thunen model, and women in agriculture. So let's start with the first agricultural revolution. The first agricultural revolution started in Southwest Asia about 10,000 years ago. And this is the cultivation of seed crops, which marked the beginning. This is when we went from being exclusively hunter gatherers to actually learning how to farm. Uh, so it did develop in more than one area at different times. It started in Southwest Asia, the area known as the Fertile Crescent, but also it happens independently in places in East Asia, like the Northern China Plain, also in parts of Africa, also in parts of the Americas. We see uh, humans around this time period all figure out how to domesticate crops and animals later. The second agricultural revolution coincides with the Industrial Revolution, which means it really gets started in the 1800s. And this would move agriculture beyond subsistence to generate surplus needed. So this is really kind of the beginning of large commercial agriculture. It composed of a series of innovations and improvements in techniques. Initially started in Great Britain, the Netherlands, Denmark, and other neighboring countries in Western Europe with inventions like the seed drill, new fertilizers, artificial feed, advances in livestock breeding, innovations in machinery and transportation, increased output made it possible to feed a much larger urban population. This also saw the consolidation of farms with the enclosure movement in the UK. So bigger, much more productive farms because of the second agricultural revolution. The third agricultural revolution is also known as the Green Revolution. It really starts in a big way in the 1950s. It does date back to the 1930s, but it is associated with the use of biotechnology to expand agricultural production. So the science enables farmers to produce crops more intensively on the land and to bring more marginal land into production. The Green Revolution relies on the hybridization of seeds, which are mainly GMOs, the intensification use of technology and irrigation, and expanded use of land. Also, a lot of times we're talking about chemical pesticides and fertilizers being used uh, in this as well. So uh, the biggest uh, success story with the Green Revolution really happened in the 1960s in India with the rice, with this golden rice. Um, and it, during the time period of the largest population growth in the entire world was able to feed a lot of mouths. Also brought new high yield varieties of wheat and corn to the US, which has made us extreme profits when it comes to these commercial crops. So this also came at a time of increased concern about global hunger because of population growth. So the promise of increasing food production has been seen favorably. However, there are negatives as well, included social changes, health risks, and environmental hazards of uh, the Green Revolution technology. So the gene revolution is this new biotechnology revolution that we're currently in. This altering of the chemical makeup of crops and the modifying the genes of the plants to create new crops through biotechnology. Production of these GMOs has accelerated over the past 20 years, and it's found in 60 to 70 percent of all processed foods today, especially in the U.S. There's major debate going on with these GMOs. Proponents argue that they help feed an expanding world population. Opponents say that companies are releasing organisms into the environment without understanding the environmental health or socioeconomic issues. The impact of pollen dispersal on these organisms and the potential for disease resistant plants to spur the evolution of super pests. So we are already seeing this. We're seeing bugs and things like that that are already resistant to some of these GMOs happening. So in response to the highly processed, genetically modified foods that are mainly in developed countries today, we've seen kind of uh, an opposite movement, and that's with the organic non-GMO eat local movement. Organic agriculture now accounts for just over 4% of all food sales in the U.S. And fields are devoted to producing all kinds of foodstuffs. 
It has helped some farms, uh, farmers in the, the core countries to extract themselves from the control of those large companies' interests. There's also some clear environmental benefits to organic and non-GMO. However, you cannot grow as much food. It is not as intense uh, of production as uh, a non-organic. The Eat Local movement aims to connect producers and consumers in the same geographic region to develop the self-reliant food network and improve the economies in local areas. Commercial agriculture. Non-subsistence farming was profoundly shaped by colonialism in many poorer countries. You guys hopefully already understand that the Atlantic slave trade was really all about commercial agriculture. Slaves were mainly brought to the Americas as uh, commercial agricultural laborers on plantations. So this implemented a system to benefit their needs and tended to lock the poorer countries into producing one or two cash crops. And today, this is really a big part of what we call neocolonialism. We're using many of these less developed countries today to produce uh, the foods that we want in developed countries, like coffee in South America and in uh, Africa, as well as cocoa, which we use for chocolate in those same places. So uh, collective action is difficult to coordinate, as the importing countries can buy from other countries. And cash crops are grown on these large estates are termed plantation agriculture. So today's plantations are found in less developed countries. And again, it's part of this neocolonialism, this colonial legacy that persists in poorer, primarily tropical countries that also uh, do mainly subsistence agriculture on their own. But that's actually a problem because many of these subsistence farmers are now turning to plantation agriculture, which means they're no longer growing food for themselves and are now growing food for exports. So many productive plantations though are actually owned by European and American individuals or corporations like Nestle, which is one of the biggest chocolate producers in the world, owns a ton of plantations in uh, the Ivory Coast, a country in West Africa. Subsistence agriculture has taken hold where farmers feel production for the global market has not benefited them financially or culturally. There's really two different forms of subsistence agriculture, sedentary and shifting cultivation. Shifting cultivation is primarily found in tropical, subtropical areas where farmers have to have abandoned plots of land after the soil becomes infertile. The soil in the rainforest is actually not very good, not good for agriculture for sure, which is why it's called shifting cultivation. They can only use these fields for a couple of years and then they have to leave. The way that they clear it is called slash and burn. So you cut all the rainforest down, you burn the debris, then you use the field for a few years. And this reflects the central role of the controlled use of fires in place where this technique is used. Again, that's that burn and slash and burn. So you absolutely need to know the 11 different agricultural regions. You need to know where they are located and the basic functions of that type of agriculture. So uh, there are five uh, different types in less developed countries and six in developed countries. So most of the ones that are found in the developing countries with the exception of plantation agriculture are all subsistence forms of agriculture. So pastoral nomadism is found in dry lands of North Africa and Southwest Asia, Central and East Asia as well. Basically these places around deserts. So around the Sahara Desert, around the Arabian Desert, around the Gobi Desert is where we find pastoral nomads. Then we have shifting cultivation, which is found in tropical regions along the equator in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Well, again, we just went over that. That's that slash and burn. The most common type of agriculture we see in less developed countries, though, is intensive subsistence. And we really have two different types. We have intensive subsistence with wet rice dominance, which means they're mainly growing rice. And that's going to be found in the areas that are mainly getting the monsoon rains and also some of the largest populations in the world, like South Asia and parts of East and Southeast Asia. Then we have intensive subsistence other than rice, which is usually wheat, and that's going to be found in the areas that don't get as much rainfall of uh, East and South Asia. So it's going to be more in northern India, northern China, and so forth. 
And then we said the only type that's commercial that's found in less developed countries is plantation. And plantations today are found again in less developed countries in tropical, subtropical regions along the equator, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. So first up, we said pastoral nomadism, which again is found in those dry areas in Northern Africa and uh, the Middle East and East Asia is based on the herding of domesticated animals. Again, this is a type of subsistence agriculture. So they are herding these animals for their own survival, which means they are primarily using the animals for dairy. They do grow crops in the summertime. They are nomadic, but they typically stay in one place for a season and they grow crops. So it's mainly going to be things like wheat and dairy that they mainly consume. They don't wander randomly, but have a strong sense of territoriality. And they practice what is known as transhumans, that seasonal migration of livestock between mountains and lowland pasture areas based on the growing of the grass. The second type, again, of subsistence agriculture found in less developed countries is shifting cultivation. So again, we said this has to do with that slash and burn it's found in the tropical areas. Intensive uh, subsistence with wet rice, farmers work intensively to subsist on a single parcel of land. So a small bit of land, but they have to work it really hard. And wet rice refers to rice planted on a dry land in a nursery, then moved as seedlings to flooded fields to promote growth. Rice grows in these flooded fields, which is why it's predominant in areas that get a lot of rainfall during the monsoons, like South Asia and Southeast Asia. Intensive subsistence with other crops is going to be in places where there's not enough water for rice. And usually it's going to be wheat because wheat is a grain that doesn't require as much water. And this is going to be found again in the interior in northern India and also in northeastern China. Then the only one we said in less developed countries that's commercial is plantations. And these are generally found, again, in uh, these areas near the equator. However, a lot of them are owned and operated by companies based in Europe and North America. So the crops processed at the plantation and then that shift as processed goods are less bulky. So some of the crops that are grown on plantations include cotton, sugarcane, coffee, rubber, tobacco, cocoa, jute, bananas, tea, coconuts, and palm oil. They must import workers and provide them with food, housing, and social services. Unfortunately, one issue we see in these places is uh, forced labor, which means modern day slavery is still occurring in many of these places, including child labor. So you also need to know the six different types of agriculture that are found in developed countries. And all of these are commercial types of agriculture, meaning that the purpose of them is to make money. So the first is a mixed crop and livestock, and this is mainly found in the U.S. Midwest and Central Europe. Then we have dairying, which is primarily near population concentrations, which means the U.S., the largest is going to be in the Northeast, and then also in California, because those are our two largest population concentrations, and then Northwestern Europe, Southeastern Canada. Grain is mainly going to be found in the north central U.S., so that's mainly in the Great Plains, and south central Canada and eastern Europe. Ranching is going to be found in dry lands of western North America, southeastern Latin America, central Asia, sub-Saharan Africa, and Chile. Basically, ranching takes place in the same type of climate as pastoral nomadism, but in more developed countries. Mediterranean is only going to be found in the Mediterranean climate. So those are very specific places, obviously around the Mediterranean Sea, also on the coast of California, southern tip of South Africa, also the coast of Chile, and the uh, south central coast of Australia. And then commercial gardening is mainly found here in the southeast U.S. and southeastern Australia. So mixed crop and livestock is the most common form of commercial agriculture here in the U.S. We said it's mainly going to be found in the Midwest, and most crops are fed to the animals. Livestock supply manure to improve soil fertility for the crops. So it's this, excuse me, this beneficial to both uh, the animals and the crops. And nearly all land area is devoted to the growing of the crops. They sell mainly the animals. 
to permit uh, farmers to distribute the workload more evenly over the year. Corn is the most frequently planted in the U.S. That's what we mainly feed to livestock here in the U.S. is corn and soybeans. Dairying is the most important practice on farms near large urban areas. In developed countries, the most important is the first ring outside those large cities, which we'll talk about in the Von Dunen model. Farmers face economic difficulties in dairying due to declining revenues, though, and rising costs. So grain farming is commercial grain agriculture, and it's distinguished from mixed crop and livestock because the crops on grain farms are grown primarily for consumption by humans instead of animals. So the most important in grain farming is wheat. And this increase is in developing countries output due to growth in large scale commercial agriculture. Large scale production is heavily, heavily mechanized and conducted on extremely large farms and oriented to consumer preferences. Generally located in regions too dry for mixed crop and livestock. Wheat requires less water than corn. So corn is mainly grown in the Midwest. Wheat is mainly grown in the Great Plains. And uh, so you see that here. Winter wheat, Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, spring wheat, Dakotas, Montana, Saskatchewan, and uh, um, Canada. Ranching is the commercial grazing of livestock over an extensive area. The importance of ranching in the U.S. extends beyond the people. It's been important in pop culture with cowboys and has helped to draw attention and to illustrate the crucial role it plays in history and settlement of the U.S. West. The spread of crop farms has converted the U.S. from ranching to crop growing, though. So we've seen a decline in actual true ranching. The growth of ranching has been seen more in developing countries, and China is becoming a major lead, leading producer of meat. In Western China, they have dry lands, which are good for ranching. Mediterranean climate, we said again, is going to be those very specific areas that have Mediterranean climate. And uh, they uh, have winds that provide moisture and moderate winter temperatures. Most crops are grown for human consumption in Mediterranean agriculture. The most important are olives and grapes. And the most important product that comes out of Mediterranean agriculture is wine. So most of the world's wine comes from those very few regions. Aquaculture is the rearing of aquatic animals or the cultivation of aquatic plants for food. Commercial gardening and fruit farming, we said, is the most common type of agriculture found here in the southeast. That's why Georgia is known as the peach state. Florida is known for oranges. So we grow these fruits and vegetables because of our climate. We have a good climate for fruits and vegetables. We're also accessible to large markets in the eastern U.S. Farming is frequently practiced in the region. So that's highly efficient to large scale operations that take full advantage of machines at every stage. Willing to experiment with new varieties, seeds, fertilizers, and other imports and inputs to maximize efficiency. Also, a lot of hired migrant workers are used to pick a lot of these fruits and vegetables, and they tend to specialize in few crops. We've also seen specialty farming has spread to New England, so growing crops that have limited but increased increasing demands like asparagus, peppers, mushrooms, strawberries, and nursery plants. So the Von Thunen model is named after a German uh, agricultural geographer known as Johann Hendrik von Thunen, and he developed it in 1826. And this says that a commercial farmer initially considers which crops to cultivate and which animals to raise based on market location. So in the center of the Von Thunen model is the market, meaning where the things are going to be sold, which typically means a city. So farmers compare, uh, compare two costs, the cost of land and the cost of transportation. And he said that this is where things are going to be located based on those, those factors. So the first ring outside of the city in the suburb, so the first rural area is going to be uh, the dairy, which is known as the milk shed and also market gardens. The reason why you're gonna produce your dairy and your tomatoes right outside the city is because they're expensive to deliver. Tomatoes, because they're very fragile and also highly perishable, same with milk. So they have to get to the market fast. And so that's part of the reason why they're gonna be found close. The second ring, according to Von Thunen, 
is wood. During the 1800s, wood was used uh, much more frequently than today for fuel, for heating homes, for building homes, for everything. You need the wood to be close. Plus, it's expensive uh, to transport because it's so heavy. The third ring outside the city is going to be for various crops. So this is going to be things like grains and so forth. This can be further away because it's not as perishable or fragile, which means it's not as expensive to deliver. And then the fourth is going to be specifically for ranching. You can have this again further away. You want it to be extensive because you need a lot of land. So you want that land to be cheap and also the animals can transport themselves. So the model assumes that all land in a study area has similar site characteristics and was uniform quality. Now that's not really true in real life. The model also could vary based on topography, especially things like a river, because rivers can really impact transportation costs. So again, here is the von Thunen model uh, as we see it actually displayed. So the center, the market, which would be the urban center, the city and the suburbs. First ring, we see the milk shed and market gardening. Second, we see forest. Third, we see greens. And fourth, we see ranching. Lastly, let's talk about women in agriculture. On average, women comprise 43% of the agricultural labor force in developing countries. And typically, women work longer hours than men. They tend to be employed for more labor-intensive tasks. And uh, wage workers dominate employment in areas of export-oriented high-value agriculture. So women are extremely important, especially in subsistence agriculture in less developed countries. All right, that concludes it for part one, which was unit five, agriculture. Next, we're going to review unit six, industry and development.